I'm, I'm very, very pleased to be able to share uh, today with you um, about the project economy and, and why I think projects are the future. Um, so basically, you've seen a bit my profile. Um, I've been lucky to be part of the PMI board. I've been volunteering for many years. In 2016, I was the chairman of PMI. So I'm, I'm very, very passionate about project, project management, and especially PMI. I publish, I teach, uh, I've been recognized by Thinkers 50 uh, for the work around projects. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here with, with this large community and share some of the insights that I've collected by researching uh, projects and good projects over the last 15 years. So I, I want to cover today um, a couple of very important elements that I see happening in the world around us. Um, first of all, I, I'll talk about the project economy. What, what, is, what is it? And what is, how did we came with that concept? Second, I think um, project management has been very successful over the past 50 years, so, but it will need to reinvent itself. So what are the things that could change or could evolve and how do we see finally the role of project managers in the future? So these are the three things I want to cover in today's session. So let's get right into the first topic. What is the project economy? There are two big trends or two big research points that I want to um, share, uh, which will make you understand better what the project economy is all about. So first of all, if you look at this slide, this is uh, just one company. Imagine this one company uh, over, this is a, a very old company, so this is a company which probably lasted 100 years. Um, on the left side, you see the, the total amount of uh, resources the company has, employees and budgets. So what it means is that the company split their work into day-to-day -day operations, running the business, and projects, which is the change in the business. So 100 years ago, companies didn't have many resources dedicated to projects. Most of the work was on day-to-day -day operations, as you can see clearly on the blue part of the slide. Over the years, very um, minor changes, shifting, happen how companies are organizing their resources. A lot of improvements happen on how to organize the operations of a business, from tailor to mass production to ERPs to outsourcing to business processing, green greening. There has been a lot of work to do that blue part more efficient, uh, less expensive and, and faster. What happens is there's, there's a small shift, and every year there's more projects in companies, there's more people dedicated to projects, and, and what you see today is that <clears throat> In companies I've worked for, in a bank, for example, at one point a few years ago, there was about 60% of the employees were working in day-to-day -day operations, about 30 to 40% were working in projects. Um, so that's the trend that's happening. The shift of type of work um, and, and the way we interact with each other is completely different. But there's a big change here as well coming up, is that as soon as artificial intelligence, robotics, is hitting mainstream organizations, which has happened already in some sectors, and it will happen in the next, the amount of operational work will diminish completely because these uh, new technologies and disruptions will uh, take over part of the operation. So there will be very little left for people to be doing on day-to-day -day activities. So there's an increase in shift and resources and employees working project-based. So this is a dramatic change. Working projects, we all know that, is very different than working hierarchically, which is the best structure for running the business. So this is one big, big trend. The, the type of work is shifting. And this to the point of the following research point coming from Accenture Strategy uh, Survey, they did that last year, and they talked to uh, thousands of senior leaders, and they, one of the questions is, how do you see the workforce of the future? And they say about 80% of senior executives agree that the workforce of the future will be structured more by projects than by job function. To the point that some companies I've heard, massive big companies, are considering canceling 
other job description. Imagine for a second, think for a second, we all had job descriptions in our careers, maybe many of them. Job descriptions give you what you need to do in that job, so it gives you some perspective for the three to five next year, your career path, and suddenly they delete all the job descriptions. They cancel the end of job description. Why? Because companies start to realize that people are not really working on their job description activities, they're working on projects. So they are going to be assigned to a project for six to nine months. In that project, you will play that role. And then once the project is over, you move into a new project. This is the way consulting companies tend to work. You move from one project to another, but traditional companies is completely new. So it's becoming a big disruption in banking, in pharma, in telecom, where people are starting to lose their job descriptions and moving into project roles, much more uncertainly, uh, so creating a bit of anxiety in the people. So this is one of the big trends uh, of the project economy. The type of work is changing. There's another big trend, uh, which means that there is much more investment in infrastructure projects, in the economy, and that leads to more projects, to the point that actually PMI um, in the pulse of the profession was saying that the world needs to spend about 57 trillion on infrastructure by 2030. Um, so this is millions of projects that people will need to be engaged. And to the other point is individuals working in project-based roles will increase from 66 million to 88 million. So the future looks like it's going to be project-based. And if you look at beyond organizations, which is what I just covered, you see that the role of the board, boards of directors, boards of companies, is paying much more attention on project work. Before, boards were more about risk management, audit, ethics, uh, but now there is pressure for boards to understand how the company will create value, which are the big initiatives the company is investing, and how are they implementing. So boards are starting to be more curious and interested in implementation of projects and, and big transformation. So the boards are playing a bigger role and putting more pressure on organizations to become better in projects. Third one is education. This is a massive shift that is happening. So our children or kids will be learning and will be taught much more project-based than 20 years ago where I remember when I was in high school or university, the way I was taught was this is the book, read the book, memorize the book, and then you come back to the exam and, and then it will test how much you memorize. It has been proven that project-based education is much more impactful, much, much more successful in terms of learning for kids, adults, than the traditional way. So you see more and more schools uh, from young ages till university where project-based education is being favored and put forward. So that's good news. Everybody from kids will start learning projects, the basics, but they will be familiar much more than we were project-based. And then this is something also which has a huge impact is governments are starting to work and see their um, yeah, responsibilities, the implementation of their policies through projects and projects which mean collaboration with citizens. Especially, I've seen some interesting cases in Ireland where they were working project based uh, for six, nine months, politicians, functionaries, uh, citizens to deliver some impactful projects for the society. So, this is happening now. This is the project economy. But there's something that we need to be aware of. So, yes, great news. Things are becoming project based, we're becoming more relevant. But According to many research done around projects and change and transformation, strategic initiative, half of the projects fail. So this is something that it cannot last for long. We cannot keep failing on the projects. We should improve those rankings. We should be improving 
how we deliver projects. We should understand better how projects can be successful. PMI has done a lot in this respect, but there's still quite some room for improvement. Uh, you see two statistics here, which are really shocking. Imagine we could do 80% um, <laughs> of our projects would be successful. The value that that would generate for companies, for society, for individuals, that's massive, massive. And it doesn't need to be new technology, it's just doing the projects right. So there's a lot of room for improvement. We keep failing quite a lot in projects. And the second big threat for me is that I do talk a lot with project managers, PMOs, directors, and so on. And we seem to not see the disruption that is going to impact projects and project management. We always see the disruption happening somewhere else, in pharma, in, in biotech, in, in telecom. But yes, there is going to be disruption in, in the way we do projects. And according to Gardner, they recently, this is last year, they said that <clears throat> according to them, 80% of today's project management tasks will be eliminate, eliminated by 2030 by artificial intelligence. This is shocking. 80% of the work that we currently do will be eliminated. I, I panicked when I saw this, but then it made me think and say, okay, let, let's see if they, there is some truth on this. Let's see if we will go through a disruption as well, that we never think about our own disruption. Well, <laughs> actually what happens is that many of our work is based on reporting. So 30 to 50% is reporting. It's, it's asking people to provide us information. We consolidate, then we make an update, then we report, and, and the cycle starts again. Um, so yes, this is administrative work or high level uh, yeah, administrative task, but that part, it makes sense. So. What's going to happen? What is going to be left for us uh, to be successful in the project economy as we want to be? So this is just setting the scene. The project economy is here. Project-based work is increasing. There is more and more projects because of the speed of change. But half of the projects fail, and artificial intelligence disruption will happen in the way we manage projects. So that was the first part just to set a bit the tone and the context. So let's move to the next section. And there will be good news. Now I just, I'm sure I scare you a bit and make you uncomfortable. But I'll, I'll try to give you the direction where we need to move forward. So the next part is about the need to reinvent project management. How, how can we avoid that 80% of our current work is taken over by uh, artificial intelligence. So there is one very important aspect which touched me uh, very much. It's, it's, uh, I remember when I started in project management 20 years, more than 20 years ago, people didn't understand what I was doing. Uh, it was hard to explain uh, just to my friends or family what was the project, what was the deliverable a milestone and so on. So, Yes, it was a bit frustrating that people recognized what I was doing. Um, so just let me give you another statistic. This comes from Google. Google has digitalized all the books that they could find. Um, so it's called Engram. Um, it's a bit like Google Maps where you see all the streets, but Engram is about all the books that have been published over the past 150 years. They digitalized. So you can do searches on that huge database. So one of the searches I did for my previous book, The Project Revolution, was how do these words relate to each other? So which are the words which are most frequently published, meaning which are most used um, in business environments and management environments? So I use words like project, strategy, sales, operations, information, project management. So you can see in this trend something which for me was extremely revealing on how we see project management and the future of projects and project management. So what you see in the chart is that there's one word that is being used more and more and more and more frequent than nothing before, which is project. In fact, if you go to 
work uh, tomorrow or yesterday you were at work and I, I can't imagine that you heard the word project and project maybe 20, 30 times. It's probably the most frequently used word in, in organizations. We launched this project, we're having this problem in this project, I'm busy with these two projects, I cannot sleep at night, this, this, this project is just being constantly delayed. So that's something that is relevant. So yes, companies are using the word project. Um, and you see the difference with strategy and sales and operations. You can see in this chart also how project has overtaken operations by far. Remember one of my first slides where I split the work into operations and projects, change and run the business? You can see that's happening in this different statistic and research point demonstrated here. But then you go below, so words that are not so much used in information, the knowledge, project management, and agile. So there's a big gap in the terms we understand. Companies, senior leaders, executives, Politicians, um, faculties, they use the word project, but project management is very technical. It's something that people don't understand. Uh, I think it's not their fault. We tend to make it too technical, uh, very complex. We don't use simple words. In fact, part of my research has found out that <clears throat> Simplification is one of the most difficult things to do. We like to talk technical because it looks like we know a lot. Uh, we've been trained for that. But this is not useful for the people we're working on, the stakeholders, the senior executives. In fact, if we look at successful management theory, go back and remember when you were studying at university or doing a master in business, what were the theories that you remember? The most simple one. Let me give you the first one. This one is called the five forces from Michael Porter. Five forces are used to study strategy. Do you need to be a PhD to use this framework? No. Anybody can use it. Any startup, any senior leader, anybody can use it to look at their market, their suppliers, their products, their the entrance, how difficult is entrance you see that uh, industry. So you see the simplicity with one framework, you can have a good assessment of the strategic elements in your industry. So that's a, an example of simplicity. If you look at marketing, those that study marketing, there is the seven piece of marketing um, from Kotler. And here it's about seven P's, the product, the price, the place, the promotion, people, position and packaging. You answer all these seven questions and you'll have already a good sense on marketing of your business, your strategy, and so on. Very simple. Culture change management model, this is probably your most familiar uh, with the eight phases and they are all sequential starting with the urgency uh, to change, so very simple. And actually, one of the big, as we've seen, a competitor of project management, the Agile movement that started in 2001, actually one of the reasons for their success is because it was very simple. Very simple compared to what we had those days in projects and project management, the Agile Manifesto, you could show it in one page, in one slide. You could talk about their principles and their, uh, yeah, and their values and their manifesto and in a couple of slides. People understood. You don't need to be an expert in Agile or IT to understand the importance of the customer feedback and, and the people over process. This just resonates to everybody. So there is just an example of very simple theory. Let me move to the question I have prepared for you. Uh, many of you, uh, I'm sure, have taken the PMI, PMP, you've uh, read uh, the project management body of knowledge. And so I want to ask you, um, and there will be a small tool about that, when was the first edition of the PMBOK published? 
not the draft version, the first edition. So I have here the four options. Take 10 seconds to think about and answer when was the first edition of the BM box published. you have all answer and, and you can see the spread. Actually, the first edition of the PM box published was 1996. As you can see in the slide, um, we're talking about 1994 is the first exposure draft, but 1996 was the first edition. What I want to also to highlight here is the number of pages that the PM box had when it was first published, 176, uh, 64 the exposure draft. But have you seen the exponential growth uh, of the PM box? I think uh, from 176 pages to the latest version, which has 756 pages. So uh, the increase in complexity of project management has been exponential. Uh, I'm not saying what the content of the PM box is wrong. I think it's actually very, very good, but it's just very, very professional. Somebody who's not preparing the PMP or who's not working in project just do the uh, casual project management or have been a sponsors of projects, they will not read the PM box. They, they don't have anything to refer because it's so complex uh, and, and requires so much time to grasp that this is one of the challenges I've noted for project management. Very technical, very good, a bit too complex for the normal people around us, the key stakeholders. So my proposal in terms of reinventing project management, there are three areas that I want to cover here, I want to share. There is a need to simplification of the frameworks so that anybody can apply them and be successful. You should not be a PhD in projects or to be able to deliver a small project, your own projects, understand the role that you play in the project and how can you deliver better. The second part, which goes also to the skills of the project management, is we've been seeing project management from a narrow view. It's the project life cycle. We need to expand that, and I'm going to tell you more about that. And then we need to, I think, evolve with the constraints, the triple constraints, the way we measure success in projects. I think there needs to be a different way to look at that, as we have evolved so much since this was initially developed in 1996. So let me just quickly walk through. This is just <clears throat> pure uh, for your information. My proposal has been to develop a project canvas. The project canvas is kind of um, uh, an idea I got from a good friend, Alex Osterwald, who created the business model canvas. He created the one pager to define the business model of a company. So I thought, why can't we not create one pager to look at the project and see whether that project is, uh, is, is well fundamented? We have all the elements or we miss too many and it's better not to start. So the canvas is divided in four dimensions. First, the why. The why is why are we doing this project? And you cannot imagine how many times I talk to project managers and they're not able to tell me the why. They will tell me we're building this CRM system. We're building this new organization. That's not the why. We've trained for telling what we deliver, but not why we deliver. So the why is absolutely very important and we need to spend time in defining that, uh, which is what will create the engagement of the people. We are setting up this system so that we can uh, interact better with our customers, understand them better, and be able to sell them better services and grow our business. That's the why. The who is the sponsor and the governance. So this, this is, again, one of the reasons why projects fail is lack of involvement of senior leaders and the sponsors not playing the role. So I try to make that clear. 
the what, the how, and the when, these are the knowledge areas that we all know, so there's nothing new. A big element is the soft skills, the HR, stakeholders, and the change management. And the fourth dimension is where does this project take place? So it's not the same to carry a project in a project-driven organization where projects get the budget, the power, the resources, uh, it, or in a company where there is, is very strong the functional element, as you know from the PM box. So the, the higher priority of your project, the more likely it will be successful. So this plays a big role. You can have a great project, but if it's low in priority, if it lacks support, that project will not be successful. The second element I'm proposing is, I call the project manifesto. I'm not going to cover it here, but I do think, and I, I, I invite you to read that either through the screen or there's in linking something that you can read as well. <coughs> the Agile Manifesto was successful because of its simplicity. So I do believe now that we just uh, went to our 50 years anniversary in PMI that we should have a manifesto for the project economy. So this is just a working um, document that has received input from many people. I, 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 I wish and I hope that we can have something that we can communicate and, and share with leaders around the world, with future uh, um, leaders that say, well, in the project economy, these are our values. These are what drives our principles. So I invite you to read it. Um, uh, actually, there's another webinar I did in project management dot com that you will I was going through all these steps. It's not the point. So the point I want to make here is simplification. We need we, we should keep what we have, but to the external world we need to simplify and focus on what delivers most value. Second part of the reinvention. The traditional project life cycle has been as you see on the top of the screen. So ideation happens before project management, uh, before project uh, managers are involved, and only when the idea has been selected, sometimes we're involved in the business case, sometimes the business case is even done, and we just take it from there. Do we do the implementation, we do the handover, and then somebody else will run it. And the benefit, very few will happen while the project is taking place, but it's not our responsibility and somebody else will take care. So this has been <clears throat> a bit generic, the project life cycle will play. Where is artificial intelligence going to impact us? Remember the Gartner study, the 80% by 2030? I'll let you reflect one second. Where is going to be artificial? Where can you introduce these technologies to do our job better or more efficient? Well. I think mostly in the implementation, the monitoring, the reporting, um, the testing, the planning, I think planning based on historical data, they will be able to, artificial intelligence will be able to provide you options and plans and best way to execute the project. Initiation, you will use them to do business cases and, and help you make options and take the decision and the handover. So, Basically, it's going to impact quite a lot all the elements of your project life cycle, and especially planning and implementation. So if we want to be successful and be relevant when the disruption will happen to us, and maybe it's not 2030, but sooner, what I see is that we need to move. We need to expand. We need to play a role in the ideation. Yes. We need to be able to challenge ideas. We need to be able to curate ideas and, and, and help with the idea definition, generation. And that means we need to do a bit of design thinking and link startup. And yes, why not? Because we could be doing that as well. We have ideas. Why can we not share it? So I think the project manager of the future will play a role into the ideation. And we're coming back to the skills later. I think. The running, this is something that has always created some, yeah, frustration on, on me when I see great project managers who have delivered great projects, 
uh, they spent three years, four years in a project developing a new organization, a new product, you know? and then the project is over and they move to another project. I think project managers are the ones who know most about what is delivered. So I think sometimes, and I'm going to give you a great example later on, is sometimes we should say, well, I'm ready to take this. I'm, I, I, I will not take another project. I move on and I will run this, what I built. So I think we will be moving forward the running and we'll run what we built. <laughs> and the last part, the third big area I see is the benefits. I think benefits are key and we need to get them much sooner than in the past. We cannot wait until the project is over to deliver benefits. We cannot wait three years to do that. Let me give you a couple of examples on how project management project managers can play a role. The iPhone is a great example, and I'll share about the hospital here in Belgium, Brussels. The iPhone, the first idea of creating an iPhone was shared with Steve Jobs in 2001. They said, let's make a project, we try and create a smartphone, we can beat Nokia, let's do it. Steve Jobs said, great idea, I love that market, there's huge room for improvement and disruption, but it's not the right time for us to launch a project. We're busy with iTunes, we're busy with the iPod, so no, experiment around the smartphone, experiment with a small team, and then we'll see when is the right time to launch the project. The Project Purple, which was the first iPhone, was only launched in 2004, three years after the idea was presented. Most companies I know, they would say, great, Let's launch a project tomorrow. There's no knowledge, there's no experience. What after this, in three years of exploration, they were gaining knowledge. They were talking to partners, they were prototyping small things. So what the time they came to set up the project, the options had narrowed down to two or three instead of 100. So that was an extremely game changer for the iPhone. And I think we can play a bigger role in that space too. Second, this is a hospital in Brussels which was about to uh, be launched um, in 2020, uh, but they started to operate it before. So one half of the hospital started to be operational. They started to have operations and, and people being operated and kids with babies delivered while they were still constructing. So in the past, you would do a project of a hospital until the end and then you only open them. Here they opened two years before the official inauguration so that they could start capturing benefits. So I think that's the second big area. We need to think benefits much faster. Let me move to <coughs> the third area where I think project management needs to look at things differently. We all know this. I mean, triple constraint uh, is one of the key elements of project management and how we measure the importance of projects and the success of projects. I think the triple constraint is great, but it's mostly inward focus. It's the internal kitchen of projects. It's not what people want to hear about the beauty of the project or the value. It misses the value aspect, it misses people aspect. It, you cannot know about the risk indicators. Let me give you a couple of examples. How would you consider a project that was originally scheduled for four years and budgeted that it will cost seven million? But it actually took 14 years to be completed and it costed 102. Why? This is a bad project, right? Terrible, we should have stopped it. Why did we stop it after four years? Well, let me show you which project this was. Sydney Opera House. Can you imagine if they stopped this project? The law? Why the KPIs were negative, all red, and in the end we had such a beautiful building which paid the over budget in one year and has made millions. There's something wrong in the way we measure. Another example, how would you consider a project that is more than 100 years late, 100 years late, than the original plan. This is one, one of my favorite projects. Well, absolutely. 
stop it, cancel. Why would you? It's all red here. Well, this is the Sagrada Familia, one of the most amazing churches in Europe, in Barcelona. Um, yes, they're 100 years late, but they're making benefits. Every day there's millions of people visiting and, and euros make so. Yeah, why should not be able to see that? So what I think, and this is just a draft, we need to create that triple constraint about, I call it relevance, which is about the value, the risk, the sustainability, and the benefits that the project will bring. How do we interact? What are the trade-offs we need to use? How can we monitor it? How can we report around this? Will tell us better if that project should continue or not. And most of the, the tools that I just showed should have certainly continue as they did. <clears throat> Another very amazing project in times where, yes, these people are, are feeling this confrontation and we're pushed to be enemies. And for me, while I was researching for one of my last books, is projects that were amazing, Pro good projects. There's lots of good projects. We tend to hear about the bad projects. That's what it says. But there are amazing projects. And one of them is this one that you see. This is Rwanda. <coughs> Rwanda went through one of the worst um, civil wars uh, in the 90s, where 94, you know what happened. So terrible, terrible situation uh, with millions uh, killed. But after that civil war, the new government said, well, we need to stop. We need to really stop fighting against each other. We need to unite ourselves. Yes, we've been uh, bad with each other. We did terrible things, but we cannot continue. We need to change that. We need to live together, learn to live together. So they set up a big project to reunite uh, the Hutsis and the Tutsis uh, so that they could live together. They created new towns where they both lived together. They had to go through massive sorrow and, 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 and yes, public um, feeling, uh, yeah, pity and, and so on, so that people will uh, start to move forward. But one of the challenges in Rwanda, especially in the capital, Kigali, was uh, corruption, corruption. So what they launched, they said, we're going to have here a project where we will involve the whole citizen. Everybody in the city can help to reduce corruption. How? Well, if you yourself, the family, you are clean at home, you don't litter when you're on the street, we make a clean city that will be reflected in the government and they will be less corrupted. So actually what you see in this picture is Kigali, the capital. You see any paper or any littering? No. Here's another picture, looks more like Switzerland. This is Kigali, incredible. So yes, actually with the project, they managed to make the city clean and that impacted the corruption uh, in the country. So uh, the literacy went from 48% to 71 in Rwanda, uh, <clears throat> amazing increase. They cracked down, it was one of the most corrupted countries in Africa now is the number two or three only. Um, massive, just by involving people through this project. And woman holding a seat, this is one of the most advanced and most gender equality countries in the world with 56%. And the last thing through these projects and programs, they managed to reunite the nation. So yes, uh, somewhere around the world, there's projects will have impact and will make us better and live better together. And that's why I'd like to share this example because it touched me so much when today we're hearing all these sad stories. There are places that we can learn. There are projects that we can replicate to create a better world. So basically this is the engagement of the people, which we know is a big success factor. Is what's the purpose of the project? What's the passion? How much engagement do you have from the project team and the dedication? That will determine as well the success of your project. So this is work in progress, but I felt I wanted to share with you. Uh, so the tri triple constraint, the cost, time, scope, that state, but that's internal kitchen. We need to work into the value stream, and we need to work into the people engagement stream. And this is my proposal. I welcome 
any thoughts, any feedback. This is not 100% set in stone. This is just work in progress. But I hope you can relate to that. And if we talk about value, if we talk about purpose, benefits, engagement, our project will deliver better and will be supported much more. <coughs> and the last five minutes I want to cover, what does all this mean to you? you you've been listening already for 40 minutes. So what does it mean? What can I do with that? How can I grow and develop as a project manager to be successful in the project economy, despite uh, the challenges that we see. So I do believe, and I've done research, that you guys, you ladies, anybody working in project can be a CEO. We need to think more like a CEO. We're not just the operational people, uh, the technical people, the engineers who are going to develop a product and then we don't know what happens, we don't care if it sells, if it's used, if it delivers any value. That is not possible anymore. We need to change our mindset and we need to take ownership, not just of the deliverables, but the value that we're generating. If we do that mindset shift, we are able to play the role of CEO. And I will share with you an example of a good friend that um, we used to play a lot together when we were kids. Cesar Cernuda, he's the vice president in Microsoft. He was doing some sales of Microsoft Office products. He was salesman for years. And at one point they asked him to, um, Microsoft wanted to join the ERP market, you know, the SAP market, uh, Oracle market. Microsoft was not there, so they bought a Scandinavian company software called Navision, uh, which has a strong uh, ERP product in Europe. So Microsoft asked um, Cesar if he wanted to take that project, to lead that project. So he said, yes, I'm interested. It's a big, very challenging opportunity. I've not managed projects before, so I will learn, study, uh, PMP, great. Uh, so he was heavily involved, 100% dedicated, maybe 150% dedicated on that project. The merger between Microsoft was solution and ERP coming from Navision, the merger of these two companies into a new one. And <clears throat> I was having a drink with Cesar and I asked him, so what did you do? So the project was successful, I read about that. What, what did you do after the project finished, uh, Cesar? Which other project did you take? Uh, and he said, no, Antonio, I didn't take another project. I told my bosses, I want to run this new business. I've been working three years on the project. I've been leading the project. There's nobody else who knows more in Microsoft than me. So I want to take that responsibility. I want to deliver the synergies that were planned, and uh, I'll do it. And he did that. He was successful with the project. He was very successful growing the business. So back to my point before, or on the project life cycle. We need to dare and say, well, boss, I've done this project, now it's time for me to run it. Give me the chance. And you'll see how you need to develop different skills, which is what you need to become the future CEO of a company or, or a senior leader of any company is by learning those skills too. So if you look back on the slides I had to share with you here, I think to be successful in the project economy, we need to learn about innovation, design thinking, what happens in the first phase of a project. Is it the right time to launch a project? Not every idea should be a project. Some ideas can be just prototypes. Some ideas can be using agile methods to just iterative development. Some ideas after a while will become projects, but not all of them. So we should be playing a bigger role there. <coughs> Second, benefit as soon as possible. If there's a KPI that we need to follow and something that we need to define from the beginning, the benefits that we're going to deliver as fast as possible. Uh, after three months of the project running, we should be able to see benefits communicated and, and growing. Them. So that's where we need to think about much more than what we've done so far. 
And the last thing, we need to dare to say, I want to run it next. I want to take this for the next two years and see where I take it. And then I might go back to projects or not. So if you look at the talent triangle from PMI, that means that we'll have the blue part, the technical skills. Yeah, we have them. I'm sure most of the people in this call have the technical skills and will develop them. That's the PMP, the PMBOK. That's absolutely fundamental. But then we need to develop strategic and business management. That means understanding the business, understanding how a project fits with the strategy, how a project fits with the agenda of the senior leaders, and how I can contribute to that, make it happen. So you will talk much more about that and your project when you talk to senior leader and key stakeholders, the benefits of your project. And the third dimension, the leadership. This is about engaging people. You engage people by telling them the why of your project, not the, the business case, not the deliverable. You engage people by convincing them that the why of your project, the real purpose, is so important for the company, for them, for us to make this project as successful. So I think there is huge potential for the project management community. In fact, this is something I was shared uh, last year in a Peter Drucker forum. I think there are few ways of working and collaborating, more motivating and inspiring than being part of a project with an ambitious goal, a higher purpose, and a clear fixed, day, fixed deadline. So this is what we need to aim. I do believe that we need to change, we need to evolve, but the future is right, and I do believe that we can have a huge impact in the next decade. Um, so with that, I want to thank you for listening to me, and I look forward to hearing your questions, answering your questions, connecting uh, outside, and I, I do hope you have learned, you see projects in a different way, and, and thank you very much for listening. Um, keep well. Thanks again, everyone, for being at 2020 PM Expo. This is our 13th year with this event. We're excited about the incredible participation and incredible attendance and the high value presentations we've had so far. You've been listening to Antonio Nieto Rodriguez present on the project economy and why projects are the future. Antonio has agreed to stick around and answer some questions and have some conversation. And I know I'm excited to talk to him. We have had so many questions come in. We'll do our best to try to get to kind of some themes that have emerged there. Antonio, thank you so much for uh, sticking around and agreeing to talk with us. You're welcome, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you, PMI. Thank you for for organizing this amazing event more than ever. We need this kind of event. So thank you. Thank you, PMI. Thank you to all the participants. I think together we can make us stronger. So a pleasure with here with you, Stephen, and happy to take some of the questions. Excellent. Well, let's, let's jump right into uh, what might be kind of a tough one. I'm going to take this one pretty much how it arrived. It says, the C-suite understands the shift from operations to project execution, and we who are executing projects and programs understand the shift. Mid-level and senior management are struggling to catch up with the trend. Where do you think this disconnect is happening, or why do you think this disconnect is happening? So this participant says, look, C-suite gets it, project and program professionals are getting it, but the mid and senior managers seem to be struggling to catch up. Is that consistent with what you've seen? And if so, why do you think that is? I think there's a, a good point on that question. Absolutely. I think senior leaders, I would not say they grasp it. They might understand, but they don't dedicate enough time uh, to the role of sponsor. They don't know what the role of sponsor often and how critical it is. So I would say um, uh, senior leaders still need to be coach and advice, and they need to shift the way we work. But absolutely right, middle management as well. They, the problem with middle management is that they don't have the time as well. They're 100% dedicated um, to often operational work. So they're not free up. Their KPIs, their revenues, um, is based on operational parts. So there's a lot on the cultural part that needs to change. I think middle management 
usually uh, understand projects, but they don't have the time. They're not measured their performance on that. So that's where we can help. I think we can help by uh, engaging with the senior leaders and shifting part of the attention to project-based work. Excellent question. Yeah, I, I think you've really touched on something there. It, it gets to the heart of this challenge and the struggle between running the business and changing the business. You know, that, those, that terminology became popularized some years ago, particularly in banking, run the bank, change the bank. And I, I think that's what we're talking about. You know, these are leaders that are just, they've already got so many balls in the air, as we say sometimes, that trying to shift that attention on a daily basis to projects and programs that are often about something off in the future is just, uh, right. just a very difficult challenge. Yes, absolutely. And, and this is hard to change. This is a lot of inertia, a lot of years working in the same way. So uh, like I was saying at the beginning, it, companies are thinking about canceling job descriptions. Job descriptions, you have them in the run the business, but in the change, it's about project growth. So there's going to be a moment, and I think it depends on the industry, where companies will do that. You see today already in banking, companies going to agile, completely agile, not just for IT, which is massive disruption. So this is going that way. Um, it will go faster or slower, depends on the industry, the leaders, how much risk they want to take. But definitely, we're going to see big changes that are happening very soon. So this next one, rather than a specific question, I want to speak to a theme. You got people's attention when you were talking about the, the coming disruption to project management. You specifically talked about the disruption that, that AI, that artificial intelligence will bring to project management. And I believe you said by 2030, 80% uh, of current project management tasks would be done by, by an AI. So talk to us a little bit about where the, pro the role of the project manager is going. What does that future look like, and how does that role continue to evolve, especially when we think about the advent of AIs and, and Agile and still having to um, be proficient in waterfall projects as well? And where, where is that going? If I'm a project management professional today, how do I begin to future-proof, and what should I expect? Yeah, that, I noticed that question, and that's a, a really good question. To be honest, Stephen, I was not thinking like that maybe six months ago uh, when I was working for my books. And, and yeah, a new project management had to reinvent itself. Uh, and we have to focus more on the value and on the people side. That's why I uh, proposed some different triple constraints. But uh, I saw the, the thing from Gartner, the research. You know, Gartner tends to make big headlines and and I'm not sure how much true will be coming from that statement that 80% of what we do today will be automated or artificial intelligence. But they have a point. If we look at what we do, there's a lot of administrative or high-end administrative tasks, which is actually making a plan. It, it tends to be administrative as well, WBF, um, uh, scheduling, uh, and then reporting. All these things will be sooner or later uh, done by artificial intelligence. It makes sense. So I was in a bubble thinking disruption will not happen in project management. It will happen outside everywhere, but project management. And that quote made me reflect that actually we would be disrupted too. So what does it mean? I think the project economy is there and it's going to stay. The type of work is going to be project-based, but we need to upscale our game. We need to think more as entrepreneurs and CEOs of our projects, what I was taking, telling before is not every idea should be run as a project. There's many ideas that can be run as a prototype and tested and agile. Uh, the case study of the iPhone, three years just on ex exploration. You never see that in companies. We need to take more time and choose the right projects when they're ready to be projects. And this is something that the project manager should play a role. Before you, you will get the, the business case and then we execute, no. We need to play a role in that phase. And second, we need to think about benefits from day one, not benefits when the project is over. Benefits is what set. Benefits is what you get engagement from the organization, from the stakeholders. So it's about the purpose, it's about the value, it's about the impact, and this is what we need to be start talking. Not so much about the plan, not so much about the delivery, but the impact, the purpose, the benefits, 
the value that we're generating for the organization, for the individuals, for the world. So I think that's where we can grow, becoming more senior in the sense of ownership of the project as a small company, as a small startup that we will might run when the project is over. So uh, it requires change, but I think it's a good change. It's a challenging change, but you can see success in that direction. And that's why I recommend that strongly to people because I see it so clear. I loved your example about a hospital that began offering services two years ahead of the official completion of the hospital and the official uh, launch or the official opening of the hospital uh, formally. And I thought, man, that is a, that's amazing. I've done a lot of work in healthcare myself, and, and the way you describe that is often not the way that it's been approached. Is it really that much harder to work that way, or have we just not been trained to think that way? Do you think it, it's actually a great challenge to, um, to overcome the barriers that prevent us from beginning to see value much earlier, or is it just simply a, a mindset shift? You got it, Steven. It's just a mindset shift. It's amazing how how uh, programmed we've been to think about. Let's finish the project and then we we'll start getting benefits. Let's finish the house and then we move in and then we we'll start enjoying. Let's and and it's just amazing how structure and how how we program we've been like that. And often when you see the example like the hospital, when I saw it, say. Wow, that makes so much sense. They, they plan a project for four years, but if they can't start using half of it before, why not? It requires different planning, of course, because the second part of the, the project, you need to be extra careful. You need to think about how to manage operations while people are still working and construction. So it does require some different type of planning and, 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 and caring and, and safety. But it does make a lot of sense. Unfortunately, I don't have the formula to switch our minds like that yet. So this is something that I'm exploring, but absolutely possible. Not with everything. You will not start playing a plane if it's not ready. Uh, but most of the projects, we can think like that. And actually, it's a bit agile in the way, uh, in a bigger scale, agile in, in a bigger scale, thinking about creating value as soon as possible, testing it, and and moving on to the next phase of the project. So, yeah, it's a it's a mind blowing example, but I think companies don't have the time to wait four years to start getting benefits on any project anymore. Yes, yeah, especially things are changing so quickly. So, if you can begin to extract value earlier, then you may actually discover that you you don't want to do the next two years the same way. You might actually want to make significant changes in the direction of that project. Uh, because you're essentially beginning to operate in a in a real world, even though maybe you're only 20% there on the original project plan. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and, and we might shift after the two years, and the, we see the operations running, and that part is already working very well. We might take three years instead of two. We don't care. Yeah, because we're we're making money, so we might want to add new technologies to the new part of the building which we were not existing four years ago. So it allows that kind of agility that we've been asking for projects, uh, large projects that traditionally we, we didn't have in, in our plan. Antonio, sadly, we are getting to the end of our Q&A time. I wish I, had, wish I had another half hour with you. Uh, yeah. One quick question, if you can give a brief response. There's a lot of interest in the project canvas that you shared in your presentation. And so people are asking, hey, do you plan to make an editable version available? Is this going to be like the business model canvas? So tell us where you plan to go with this. Well, absolutely. Uh, yes, exactly. I, I just want people to use it. And I cannot say the final version. So people who have ideas and suggestions, uh, uh, please reach out. You know, today is very easy to connect uh, through LinkedIn, my website, whatever. But I want to build things together and, and people... There's experts that know more than me, so I have the chance to be good friends from Alex Osterval and Yves Pignon, who developed the business canvas, uh, so they are advising me. So trying to make the canvas of the project as successful as their business canvas, who has sold 10 million copies. So if we can use something similar to what I share, uh, I think I would be very happy. People will start embracing projects, not outside uh, 
business, but everywhere. And, and that's my kind of goal or aspiration, my vision. Um, so yeah, thank you for any impact or, or feedback you have on the canvas, for sure, Stephen. Thank you. Excellent. So let's build it together is the message. And with that, Antonio Nieto Rodriguez has the last word. Antonio, it has been an absolute pleasure, both a terrific presentation and then the Q&A time with you has been, has been really great. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Stephen. Let's keep working and let's keep together, especially now. Let's do it. Current thing. Let's do it. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. So you are likely finding yourself working virtually, spending more time at home. Many people around the world are. There are still opportunities to bring the world closer and grow professionally, even while social distancing. Head to the PMI booth where you can find more information about adjusting to a new normal, including a link to the COVID-19 Resource Hub, which is packed with resources and opportunities to help you during these challenging and ever-changing times. Check it out. Are you taking advantage of your PMI member benefits? I think most people don't take full advantage. There's always something there you haven't taken advantage of yet. You ought to find out about it. Visit the PMI booth and the job board in the exhibit hall for more information regarding all your PMI membership has to offer. And find out how to become a member if you're not one. If you're participating today as a guest and you're not a member, you ought to check out membership and all the great benefits that, that can bring you. Also, you'll find resources to assist you during these challenging times. As we mentioned earlier, uh, look in the adjusting to the new norm, adjusting to the new norm uh, option there. Also, be sure to visit the exhibit hall and listen to on-demand presentations sponsored by Keyden and Microsoft. Thank you, sponsors. Thank you, awesome sponsors, for making events like this possible. Keyden and Microsoft on-demand presentations in the exhibit hall. Please visit the Disciplined Agile booth, PMI's newest Agile solution. It's an agnostic toolkit that harnesses a world of Agile practices to guide you to the best way of working for your team and your organization. Your needs are going to be a little different than the person down the street. Check it out and learn more about tailored solutions for your needs. Also, I want to mention, we are searching for the biggest, boldest projects moving our world forward. If you have an idea, email that big idea for this year's most influential project. If something's in mind, a project you're watching, and you is amazing you, then Send that in to mostinfluential at pmi.org. Send your project ideas to mostinfluential at pmi.org. Thank you again for being here. Just a reminder, my name is Stephen May. I will be your host for the entire day, and it is my pleasure. Coming up at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time, that's 1.30 in New York, Bob Sapien. You do not want to miss Bob going to be talking about lessons from the most influential projects. PMI looked at the 50 most influential projects from over the last 50 years. And Bob is going to bring us great insights from that. Join Bob Sapien at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Okay.